Broadcasting live from Forward Observer Central Command in Austin, Texas. It's the man always out front on issues. You're listening to Out Front with Mike Shelby. All right, hello and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Out Front. I'm your host, Mike Shelby. Thanks everyone for being here. We have this is going to be one of probably my one of my most important shows. I think first a bit of personal news. I've been off all week, packing and moving. We're completely out of the house. We've moved up to the ranch full time, and I'm not super prepper. I'm not super homesteader. I mean, I might become that soon. But uh, I'm really looking forward to getting some ducks, spending a lot more time hunting and fishing, and maybe I'll be posting some pictures and stuff. Uh, by the way, I used to be super into Joel Salatin, and he built this little duck house called <laughs> called Duckingham Palace. I think I'm going to try to build one of those. All right. I, listen, if you're just joining the show, first of all, thanks for being here. I try to dedicate about 30 minutes a day to talk about intelligence and security, low-intensity conflict, this con- this conflict that we have looming over us. Uh, here, I mean, we're in it right now, low intensity conflict. Uh, and most importantly, I talk about how to win or at least not lose. It's 30 minutes a day where I try to provide some purpose, direction, and motivation and a way forward for navigating our gray zone future. And on that point, I'm finishing up a chapter by chapter summary of the art of counter revolutionary war. I'm going to put this into an ebook. I'm also, I will probably also have physical copies of this book printed up because it is one of the best books I've ever read. And I'll announce the details when I get it done on the show and also where you can get it. And I'll send out an, uh, an order. If people want to order the, a physical copy, uh, you can get that. I'll send it out via email and you can sign up for that email at www.grayzoneactivity.com slash dispatch. And you can also check out my upcoming courses. I'll be in Pennsylvania, be in beautiful, sunny Las Vegas, Nevada uh, later in the year. Um, after that, after I finish that, I'm going to read today was mail day and I, I got a bunch more books to read here. Uh, this, it, I've been buying these old books that are way out of print, like from the 50s, 60s and 70s about mainly about anti-communist warfare and counter counter revolution and, uh, the real, like actually really good counterinsurgency books, not the, not the crap that's produced today. Uh, after that, I'll be reading, uh, probably grass hoppers and elephants. This is the Viet Cong's account of the last 55 days of the Vietnam War. And if if it's worth doing a chapter by chapter summary, I'll I'll go in there and, and do that as well. I'll provide my I call it quotes, notes, and summary. I'll just I go through the book, I highlight what I think is important, then I'll reread the chapter, pull out quotes, and summarize all my highlights, summarize the high points. And you know, you can read a book in you can read maybe a book that takes you 12, eight to 12 hours to read to read. You can read it in probably 30, 40 minutes, something like that, maybe 20 to 40 minutes. All right. And I'll let everyone know when I get done with that. All right. Um, by the way, I'm completely focused, a hundred percent focused on low intensity conflict right now. I have stepped back a bit from over from Ford observer, uh, because Biden is going to give this speech, this anti-gun or gun control speech, whatever tonight we got midterms coming up in six months. There's going to be fallout after that. We have two and a half years until the potential catastrophic uh, failure of the election in 2024. And I say that's potential. Maybe uh, maybe things don't really pop off till 2028. But uh, between now and then, we've got stuff going on with food and fuel and, and lots of stuff going on right now. And I don't know what exactly this is going to look like, but I do know. Uh, that we have to win. And this is, by the way, this is assuming it stays a low intensity conflict. Just as a reminder, low intensity conflict is, I mean, it's effectively a war below the threat, below the threshold of conventional warfare. So we're not talking about tanks and bombers here, 
but it exists above routine peaceful competition. This is an area where we call, you know, maybe the gray zone. Uh, the gray zone is this area between war and peace. Low intensity conflict is an actual conflict. Uh, that is at a minimum, it already started at a minimum. That's what we'll see probably for, I imagine maybe the next generation, uh, certainly through the end of this decade, I would imagine. And of course that's assuming that it doesn't turn into a high intensity conflict, which it could, that's not my base case scenario, but uh, I think it could. Um, th listen, there is, we can win. First of all, we have to win the low intensity conflict. Number one, number two, we can win. Part of this is learning from history, which is why I've been reading so many books on anti-communist strategies from all over the world. Um, and then, you know, so being informed of what has worked and what has not worked in previous low intensity conflicts, that's part of it. And then, by the way, I'm writing a, a book about all this stuff. So I'm compiling all my research into notes for this book um, about how we can win our low intensity conflict here at home. And then... And by the way, if something happens to me, I think we'll just like release the book in whatever draft version it is just for free for everybody because they need to read it. And then um, we have to learn from history and then we have to think strategically and act locally, which is what today's show is going to be about. Uh, at the heart of today's discussion is the ability to counter organize. We need to be developing that ability if you haven't already. There's a reason that community organizer is a paid profession on the left. It is a career, and that's because it works, and these people are organizing for their interests. That means they're organizing against you and against your interests, and the only way we win is through counter-organizing because this is the phase of the conflict we are at. We're in the organizational phase of this conflict, and we have to counter-organize. If we counter-organize bigger and better, then we can probably win right here in this phase before it progresses any further. If we don't counter organize, then we're not going to be able to win in this phase. And it's going to get a, a lot uglier in the future. That's the only way we win. And the right has to understand that is through counter organizing. Um, listen, I was talking to a, a buddy who's an infantry veteran, veteran of Afghanistan, army guy. And he asked me, how long, it, how long do I think it takes to build a local preparedness network slash inflation sharing network. And let's just be honest, it's an Intel net. And I think for the average person, it probably takes about 18 months to build, to build what you want going into a low intensity conflict, to build the kind of local intelligence network that you want. Considering we have two and a half years before the midterms, or excuse me, uh, two and a half years before the 24 elections, uh, does not give you a lot of time to, to dilly dally. And, uh, if you, live, if you live in a red area and you've lived there all your life, 20, 30, 40 plus years, it might take you less time. Once you learn how to build an Intel network, it might take you less time because you already know those people. But if you've lived in an area for one to two, five, you know, maybe even 10 years, it might actually take you longer than 18 months, depending on how serious you are. And this is why I always stress the importance of building a preparedness network. Build it now for hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and uh, power outages and blizzards and whatever else you're really, and you know, I mean, that stuff's important. You're also building this for something that for man-made disasters, uh, which loom in the future. Uh, so at any rate, probably take you about 18 months. You don't have a lot of time. You should probably start yesterday. Bottom line up front for today's show, by the way, well, I'll get to the, the comments and questions later on. The bottom line for today's show is that community organizing is a crucial part of preparedness. It means building teams, Building tribe means gaining additional skills, resources, manpower, and uh, access and information. Expanding my local preparedness and information sharing network has been my top priority on most days. That's what I think about. That's what I consider to be my top priority for the day is expanding the network and doing the work. Uh, probably late or Next week, I'll talk about one of the ways in which I've been doing that um, every week. I, listen, it just, you've got to get out and you've got to rub elbows and talk to people and be sociable. And that's why I did the, the whole gray zone, gray zone warlord pyramid. You know, uh, part of being mentally strong means being sociable 
you have to develop some level of sociability because you got to get out and talk to people and you got to meet people and you got to network and you got to, uh, I was talking to a guy today and, uh, and I said, look, who, who's here, who here is interested in, in preparedness? And he said, oh yeah, you got to go meet this guy. Okay. So I went and met this guy and you know, stuff like that. It's a simple question. You get connected to somebody that you didn't know. And that's what building your network. And that's how you build your network. You just have to leverage the knowledge of other people and get introduced to other people that you otherwise would not have met, or maybe it'd take me a year plus to meet this guy. Otherwise, all right, at any rate, or to find him and then and then meet him. When I think about our future needs, I'm not just thinking about stuff. Yes, water, shelter, food. I'll say mission appropriate gear is important, but I'm also thinking about the people that I will need. And one of the best ways that you can build resiliency and increase your self sufficiency by networking with people who have those skills, knowledge, resources, and access. Your job right now, there's actually a really good, someone retweeted a thing I put out on Twitter and somebody said, uh, you know, people are saying, oh, you know, what can we do? What should we do? And he said, you got to start building this thing now. It's absolutely correct. Your job right now, stop buying the Stop, stop buying the silly stuff that these prepper companies are trying to sell you. I just saw one of these big prepper companies. Now they come, they or survival companies. Now they came out with a t-shirt of the month club. Okay. I'm going to guess that you can probably find a lot better ways to spend 20 bucks a month rather than buying another freaking t-shirt. Uh, if you want a t-shirt, go to Walmart and buy one for, you know, five or 10 bucks or whatever. Shouldn't even be that much at any rate. I digress. Uh, yeah, your job right now is to is to be is to identify people that you can be networking with. I'll talk about some tactics on how you can do that at a tactical level, especially for human intelligence. Talk about that next week. For now, let's talk about some way or some benefits of building your network. And hopefully, this will give you some ideas. So, one thing I think everyone needs to do is take a take a critical look at your skills and identify where your skills gaps are. What do you not know? What skills do you not have that you will expect to have in the future? And these one thing that adding people to your network can do is fill these critical skills gaps, uh, especially the ones that I can't acquire because I don't have the technical expertise and it would take me years or decades to develop the level of knowledge required for that skill. Uh, I can't do that, but I can find somebody who does that for a living and add them to my network. I still have skills, black holes, ham radio being one of those. Uh, I, I cannot tell you the difference between an ohm and a gigawatt. And I, for a decade, I know I need to learn more about ham radio. There's just, there's just not enough hours in the day, but I do have ham radio people. And, uh, you know, eventually one of these days I'll take my ham test. Actually, I think there's one coming up this month that I should probably study for. So the first thing that building your local preparedness network can do is help you fill critical skills gaps, identify what you what skills are required for the future and go out and find those people who, who do know them and leverage, start with your friends and family, leverage their networks as well. The second thing, there are material needs and operational requirements that I do not have, or I cannot acquire. One of my main priorities right now is meeting with landowners or meeting with people who run small farms or people or ranchers and get them into my preparedness network or find people who have land that could be turned into a productive farm because food and water, especially very, very important. You literally cannot live without it. And uh, at a minimum, I mean, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, people need food, water, and shelter. And so that's kind of the, that's the 25 meter target. I think right now on a strategic level, how do we get our tribe fed? Not everyone has a small farm. Not everyone has a victory garden yet. Uh, but we got to make sure people have clean water. We got to make sure people have food. That's from at a strategic level. That's been my, uh, been one of my strategic objectives is linking up with people so that we have the ability to produce that stuff. There are money people. There are fix it people. I have a good buddy could probably fix anything under the sun. I wish I had three or four of him. You know, people just like him. Um, I don't. I'm trying to get those people. There are political people. There are medical people, all the kinds of things, that you, all the kinds of operational requirements you will expect to need in the future. Now is the time to be adding these kinds of people to your network. Um, one important point I want to make, something I've been hammering on for the past week or so on the show, is the need to develop political, social, and economic power. The more 
political, social, and economic power we build today, the more we can flex in the future. And if you haven't developed any of those powers, then you will not be able to deploy those power those powers in the future. And the reason why we want to build political, social, and economic power is so we can have, if we can't have control over a situation, then I want to be able to influence the situation. And the more political, social, and economic power I have or we have as a collective, we have as a network, the greater amount of control and influence we can exert on the future to, to protect our interests and to, to defend ourselves in our interests. Absolutely critical point. You must understand you must be building political, social, and economic power. And then the third thing is a fundamental truth of networking is that every individual has their own network. They have their own friends and families. They have uh, their own coworkers and acquaintances. They have their own networks. And it just so happens that these people have other people in their networks who I want to meet. For instance, I don't know the mayor of this town. But I know people who do know the mayor. And in some cases, uh, in some cases, knowing people who have access to the mayor is just as good as knowing the mayor. So identify those people, those strategic people that you want to meet or the people that you want to have some kind of political influence over. You know, I'm not talking about anything illegal. Uh, I'm not talking about extortion or anything like that. I'm just talking about, hey, there's a massive block of voters. And if you if you sign this bill or you, I don't know, you pass this rule or make this new law, uh, we are going to vote your ass out in November. And if you have a big enough political crew to, if you got, <laughs> if you got enough ass behind that, uh, you could probably exert some political influence in your area. And that's exactly the kinds of stuff I'm talking about. So many people, God, they want to argue about uh caliber and oh barrel length and uh oh should you have three or seven uh, or, uh three or six magazines or you know four or, or seven magazines and it'll combat load up. oh my god you only got four you're gonna die and that's stupid bullshit for the most part 99 percent of cases that's stupid bullshit uh one percent of the time that stuff matters 99 percent of the time the ability to exert political social and economic power is far more important than any other uh, any uh, any other stuff like that. So um, identify these people with access. Identify the people who know people. And then you can ask for an introduction. You know, I want to, uh, you know, I'm looking for a surgeon, let's just say. Okay. We are, our mission right now for this group, or our task right now for this group is to uh, build a field hospital or build some kind of, uh, uh, long, you know, long-term uh, field care. So if people are preparing for a grid down or preparing for whatever, or for, you know, there's, there's just, maybe there's not a hospital in the area. And we want to, we want the ability to have a, an operating uh, field, field care clinic or field hospital or something like that. All right, well, let's start tasking our friends. Hey, uh, let's start with an EMT. Who knows a paramedic or an, or an EMT? Let's just start there. And then you can move to a physician. Then you can move to a surgeon or whatever. Oh, great. There's a retired surgeon. He lives five minutes away. Hell yeah. Let's go talk to that guy. And let's see if he will help us build something like that. Maybe he'll run the thing. Uh, so when I talk about networking, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Getting involved in the community, finding who lives in your community. This is why doing an area study is so vitally important because we learn about the groups and individuals who live in our backyard. And if you're not doing an area study, you are wrong. You must do an area study because there's so much valuable intelligence that we can build in that area study that we can then exploit later. And I don't mean exploit in a bad way. I mean, we can exploit it to our advantage in a very good way. By the way, Jen coming in heavy with the super chat. Your content is so valuable. Thank you. I, I certainly appreciate that. The twenty dollars super chat is probably going to go to uh, duck feed, so I can have wake up and eat duck eggs for breakfast every morning. So I certainly appreciate it. Thank you very much for that, Jen. Um. All right. So the bottom line here is that the the better our network, the more nodes in my network. It means the more people I can recruit, the more people I can get introduced to, the more people I can influence, the more people I can exert political, social, and economic pressure over. But the catch is that you only get to exercise the power that you build, which is why 
building these vehicles to exercise power today is so important for tomorrow. Um, listen, next week, I'm going to send out an email about, I'm going to tell some personal stories, some things that I've been working on here locally, how I've been able to, I don't want to say finagle, but how I've been able to uh, gain access to individuals that would have taken me a lot longer to get access to it had I been on my own. I'm going to uh, talk about how to do that. In an email next week, I'll probably talk about it on the show as well. So please like, and if you like this, if you like my, what I talk about, please like this video and subscribe. Also, if I, if I do get kicked off of this, I think we're over on Odyssey now, if I get kicked off of YouTube and if I get kicked off of Odyssey, uh, you can go sign up for my emails at www.grayzone, gray with an A, grayzoneactivity.com slash dispatch and get on that email list. Now, um, I'm going to open this up for some questions. There's a couple things that I would like to talk about. And that's number one, answering this first question. Over on Twitter, someone said, maybe it's the current strategy of tension in play, but how do you contend with infiltration from international and domestic groups? History has shown that any group that develops political, social, or economic uh, power is targeted. And that's a fair point. An acquaintance of mine, maybe even a friend, a retired Special Forces team guy, had the absolute best advice for that question I've ever heard, and I've committed it to memory. He said, keep it sane, keep it local. Keep it sane is don't do illegal stuff. Got to keep it sane. Don't even entertain anything like that because, yes, there are groups out there. There are, <laughs> there are bureaus out there who absolutely are trying to entrap people. And do not fall into that trap. Do not even come close. Do not even entertain uh, talking about any anything like that. Like, you know, don't go out and talk about kidnapping a governor, for instance. Don't do any of that stuff. You got to keep it sane. And then also keep it local. One of the, sorry, one of the big, one of the big failures on the right is trying to build these national organizations. Stop that. Just stop. Just do not do it. All that, like, these national level organizations, they're absolutely ripe for infiltration and do not do that. Keep it local, right? Keep it to your town. Keep it to your county. We don't need to build a statewide organization either. All right. I'm about to fly off the handle here. These people who are trying to build these statewide or national level organizations, they don't even have influence in their own backyard but they're trying to build some national level organization. It's insane. Don't even try. Keep it sane. Keep it local. Build political, social, and economic power locally. Political power means we're going to influence the laws because this is where we live and we have political power here. Social power means we have the ability to establish cultural norms in this area where we live. We are going to shun or exclude people who, who violate those social norms. We're going to stop shopping at businesses who violate those social norms. We're going to exert all the social pressure that we can, uh, clear out the school board, get get sane people elected to the school boards, exert social and cultural power, because that's exactly what the left's doing right now. And then economic power. We're going to be able to hire our friends. Look, we're probably looking at a recession this year, maybe next year. Uh, certainly a lot more volatility economically and financially. I'm going to retain the ability to hire a friend. Oh, he loses work. He gets laid off from his job. Uh, look, man, it might not be much, but at least a part-time job. And we're going to make sure that your family's fed. We're going to make sure you're not going to kicked out, going to get kicked out of your house, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to start businesses that produce a profit and use those profits to further our interests locally. By the way, there was this really great, um, there was this really, great story that I heard. There's a, an organization here locally and the way they funded themselves is they purchased a, uh, a mobile home park. Like, I don't know, 50 years ago or something like that, or maybe 40, 30 years ago. And, uh, they collect all the rent and that place literally runs. It's, I mean, the, the mobile home doesn't, uh, mobile park trailer park doesn't run itself. But that organization is fully funded by the profits produced by that mobile home park. And, you know, it's like, okay, you, you know, 30 years ago, you had $200,000. Like, you know, yeah, you could give yourself uh, $20,000 a year for 10 years, or you could have bought this mobile home park and uh, be financed uh, indefinitely. So 
I think that's a pretty smart idea. That's what I'm talking about when I say economic power, building local businesses that that churn a profit that you can use to further your own interests. And that way you're not, you know, and you're not having to do a, a PBS, you know, fundraiser or whatever fund, you know, a uh, public radio fundraiser, a telethon every year. No, you got a business that fully sustains what you're doing, man. That's a great idea. So, uh, you know, continue to be looking uh, for, for ways that you can build political, social, and economic power with that. Uh, Dustin is over on the controls. Dustin, do you have any good questions for us today? Slide sugar asks, when I look up insurgency model images, all the recently created ones are confusing as or AF. Yet the historical versions are clear and make sense. Why do you think that is? You know, I was just reading this the other day about um, why I think it was Jim Mattis banned the use of PowerPoint. And the the whole argument was these staff officers were making incredibly complex PowerPoint slides. And they, part of the argument was that they were overcomplicating, overcomplicating things. The second thing is, yeah, you build, okay, you're a staff officer, you're a, an S2 or a G2 or what G3 or whatever. And you make a PowerPoint slide that you understand. And you're trying to brief the commander. He's like, what the F is this? jangled up mess on this slide. My guess is that the past 20 years, we have tried to PowerPoint our way out of uh, PowerPoint, our way to victory in Iraq and Afghanistan. And maybe that's why, maybe that's why today's understandings of conflict are so convoluted. Yes. These things are incredibly complex. You have to apply systems thinking it's political, cultural, economic, social. Uh, I, I mean, all sorts. Of, okay. Pemessi. All right. It's all that stuff. Uh, may, maybe that's why. All right. Uh, next question. If there is one. I found networking is easier when I can talk to someone when they aren't busy, but I've also found that the best people tend to always stay busy. How do you personally navigate this? Access. Um, if that person is busy, well, A, if that person's busy, you have to give them a good reason, right? I mean, what... What makes meeting, talking with you for 15 or 30 minutes or an hour, what makes that more important than anything else they have going on? So you have to explain to them the importance of having this meeting with you. That's the first thing. Number two, people need a break. Take them fishing. Take them hunting. Take them golfing. Take them skeet shooting. Take them wherever, okay? And, you know, you look at the the tactics of a, a salesman, you know, so I just, I got a buddy who's a sales manager, and he was telling me about how they train up their sales staff and all that stuff. And, you know, I just thought as he was talking about this stuff, I thought, you know, we kind of need to be salesmen. Like, yeah, we need to start taking people to dinner and just to have their full undivided attention for 30 or 60 minutes or, you know, take them golfing, invite them to, I don't know, do whatever. Uh, the other thing is just find out what they enjoy doing and then go do that thing with them, like golf or fishing or whatever. And it helps you have a boat. You're like, hey, yeah, let's go out. We're going to go fishing uh, tomorrow morning, you know, and, and just invite them. And maybe it takes three or four invites for them to finally come aboard. And then, but when they do, you know, you've got them for however long. So uh, that's just kind of off the top of my head advice. Great question. Next question. If there is one. Yeah, copious amounts of beer drinking. Alcohol is, uh, what was that? It's not a motivator. Yeah, sure. Get them, get them plied up with liquor. That is, a, that is definitely a, an intelligence gathering technique. Actually, George Washington, George Washington had a, an espionage career back before he was George Washington. And that was back during the French and Indian Wars, which I think was around like maybe the 1750s maybe, or 1740s, somewhere around there. So he gets tasked out with a reconnaissance mission, George Washington, and he, he goes out to the Ohio River Valley and uh, with some uh, like a local uh, Indian guide. And he run and his task is to identify how the French are building these fort systems in the Ohio River Valley. I think this is like 1752, actually. And so he goes out there and he runs into the French. And they actually invite him to this little cabin to drink for they invite him for dinner. But they said, well, the Indians got to stay outside. And so his his native guides stayed outside. George Washington went in. And these French military officers proceeded to get blasted, absolutely obliterated, drunk. And they talked about everything they're doing in the Ohio river Valley, as far as their plans for building new forts and 
uh, how many uh, how many allied Indian tribes there were and their strength and manpower. And uh, on the way back, George Washington saw a massive line of Indian canoes on the Ohio River. And he just said, okay, you got, you know, whatever, two Indians per canoe or whatever, and you got 50 canoes. Uh, okay, that, you know, that's 100 Indian troops or whatever. He, he estimated the, the Indian force strength based on their canoes. Then he went back and he wrote a report about it, and he actually became famous in England. He was famous for a short while uh, for writing this dispatch. And uh, George Washington knew very well the importance of intelligence, and that's what I want to impress on people. Intelligence matters because information matters. It helps us to make better decisions, make better decisions faster. Information is a conflict currency. I want to be wealthy. I want to be the richest guy in Babylon. Or I want to be the richest guy uh, in my in my hood, uh, because the more information that I have, the better intelligence we can, or probably the better intelligence we can produce. All right, next question. If there is a question, if not, it's two thirty central. We'll probably just bounce. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. Please do like and uh, like this video. Subscribe to it. I'll be back tomorrow at two p.m. central. We're going to talk about something else. Uh, Actually, we're probably going to talk about this book, The Art of Counter-Revolutionary War. Phenomenal book. Highly recommend it. These books are going for like two to 300 bucks a pop. So if you can find it for less than 200 bucks, definitely go out and buy it. Otherwise, just wait for my uh, my chapter summary ebook. All right. With that, everyone, thanks for watching. I'll be back tomorrow. Until then, be well and stay out front.